Well, for the last few weeks we've been looking at church culture in different forms. We've looked at prayer, we've looked at uh, relational, we've looked at um, uh, excellence, teaching. And today we're going to look at relevance, how to be relevant in today's culture. Now that is a huge, huge subject that um, you could go so many places with, which unfortunately we don't have time to do all of that. So we'll see how we go. Acts, let me read from Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with, the, with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate, debate with him, and some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Aeropagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting at the Aeropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. And as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he gives, him, gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far away from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So, we are a church that needs to be culturally and generationally relevant with the pure message of Jesus Christ. So I've been looking at a few other churches to see how do they do it, how do they structure things. So at St Arnold's they have a variety of services. So the classic, the contemporary, the mid-century modern, the post-modern, boomer service, millennials, blended service, finishing off with happy hour service. They've got just about everybody. I like this one, the light church. The church you have when you don't have church. <laughs> 24% fuel commitments, home of the 7.5% tithe, 15 minute sermons, 45 minute worship services, and we only have only eight commandments of your choice. We use three spiritual laws and have an 800 year millennium, everything else you wanted in a church and less. That's how they become relevant. Who knows what a millennial is? You want to know what a millennial is? A thousand years. Now, but what about the You've got Gen Y, Gen X's, all those sorts of things, and you've got the Millennials, and now the latest ones. So, what are their ages? Any idea? Howard's age. age. <laughs> Wrong way. These are actually the new ones. So, I actually found a church trying to share what a Millennial is and what they're like.
way She posts lots of selfie on her Instagram With the quote that's inspirational Hopes to change the world by wearing yoga Dance on with her dreams and knowledge of essential <laughs> <laughs> we are to be a church that is culturally and generationally relevant. When I talk about the church, I want to clarify something. It's not about what programs we run. It's not about what we do in the service. And it's not about how the building looks. I think sometimes we need to change our vocabulary because it just means that we start to focus too much on just the Sunday morning. So instead of saying we're coming to church, we should be saying we're coming to the meeting place or to the worship service or the hub or something like that because the reality is you and I are the church, not the building. We are the ones that need to be relevant. If we just consider the building and what happens here on the Sunday mornings as the priority and all we need to do is add a few spotlights, electric guitars and I need a better haircut to be relevant, then we've missed the point altogether. We are the church. So when I talk about church engaging culture, being relevant, then what I'm talking is about what we believe, how we speak to others around us, how we develop relationships with those we come in contact with. Why do we do this? So that we can all fulfill what we've been called to do, which is go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We are the church. Now in saying this, I believe that when we meet here on Sunday mornings for our worship service, when we're gathering together, we do need to be generational in how we present the gospel and what we do. And we will continue to evolve as a service so that we will have something for all generations. But I want to talk about us. Now, I think the church universally has made great steps forward in engaging and changing the culture and how it's shared in some ways. If you look at one example of the U Vision. Bible app. This app was created within a local church with one purpose, that's for leveraging technology to engage people in God's Word. It now has over 110 versions and is translated in over 40 languages. Over 19, me 19 
million people have downloaded the app. Over 5 billion minutes have been read on a Bible that is not bound by paper. This is a form for, we're using technology yet, being culturally relevant and engaging people where they are. And as a culture and as people, we do need to keep heading in that direction. And this is also why I've made it a priority to create a functioning website for us. I know it's a small step, but it is a step that allows us to connect with others, somewhere to share our resources, um, the sermons and things like that. I also believe that we need to continually develop this area for others. And if you do have any good ideas or suggestions, come and see me by all means. Um, I do plan in the future to have what would be classified as a members only section for us in the church for things that the public really don't need to be privy to. So things like rosters, the music sheets for the, for the worship guys and things like that. So we will continue to work on that. But in talking about being relevant, I'm well aware also that there may be some who are uncomfortable with what we're talking about this morning. And I'm also aware that it could, we could be easily misunderstood when we're talking about something like cultural relevance. It is a hot topic amongst the churches today. I heard on the radio this morning, the um, <coughs> um, Anglicans are all gathered in a thing over in South Africa, wherever they are, and the divide between the church is now that great because of certain stances and beliefs around same-sex marriage and things like that. It is a hot topic amongst people. So I want to assure you that we're not talking about political correctness here or watering down the gospel or anything of that nature. And there are some things that are foundational and that will never change with what we believe as a church and as a fellowship. So for us, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. In a world of constant change, it is good to know that Jesus is always the same that he's always there for us, and that he has always and always will love us. And also, the scripture. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. And that will never change. And we will stand on that. First Peter 1 verse 23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. The Word of God is where we get our directives for worship, for our lifestyle choices, practical instruction and for our salvation. This will never change. Relevance is based on the important concept of common ground. Being relevant with each other, common ground. Without some form of common ground between people, there is no basis for communications or relationships. Common ground serves as a starting point for which people can begin to experience and make sense of the world together. It closes the us and them gap while working to be relevant, whilst trying to stop the device of we and they. I read a quote the other day by a popular youth commentator. He says this, Christianity has become so relevant, so much embedded in our culture, that people don't notice anymore. It is so relevant that it has now become irrelevant. And I think the pendulum has appeared to have swung so far from us living in our little bubble, isolated from and shutting the world out, to trying to embrace everything that the world is to create a relationship. And by doing that, we've actually gone too far at times. As a church, we must be relevant and understand that we live in an ever-changing and evolving culture. But we also must continue to be salt and light in the world as well. And not allow this to be extinguished because of our desire to be relevant to all. People need to see Christ in us, in what we say and in our actions. The commentator finishes off by saying, so often in the Christian community, we try to change culture. We try to hold culture to account. We try to make sure that we're persuading people about the rightness of Christianity. 
when in fact I think the thing we should be most concerned about is the faithfulness of our relationship to God. Got to keep that right first up. That's our foundation. For me, the Apostle Paul was of the greatest, one of the greatest influences of the church, both in his day and now. And he effectively was able to be accepted and embraced in so many cultures, share the gospel and be used by God like none other. Corinthians 9 verse 22, he says this, To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. And that shows his passion and desire and why he does what he does. We heard earlier when I read from Acts where the Apostle Paul was interacting with the Greek people of Athens. And he was talking to them at, a, at the Areopagus, which was a council or court of justice where magistrates used to meet and other people who were supposedly of good character and they would hear about either things that are wrong or ideas or those sorts of things like that. And Paul was able to be invited there. Why? How? Well, he shared all that in that passage. So let's just go through that quickly. Verse 16. He was angry and distressed at the people of Athens because of all the idols that they worshipped. Another version says that his spirit was provoked within him. So Paul, in arriving at Athens, looked and saw what was happening and he was upset. And for me, the message is that it's okay to be distressed about what is happening in our world. In fact, if we're not distressed about what's happening, then I believe that we are more world-led than spirit-led in what we are. The more that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the more that he will open our eyes and give us a revelation to what is really going on. That's what's needed. And that's what Paul had, the spirit provoking. Behind the fun, the warm feelings that the world offers, behind all the information that is shared on through all the media, there is darkness that is not good. And unless our eyes are open to that through the spirit, then we will struggle to see that and we won't be distressed. That was Paul's passion. He was distressed about what was going on. Verse 17, he wasn't silent about what he saw. And so what he did was he discussed it with the Jews and other like-minded people at their meeting place. And every day he went on the streets and talked with anybody who happened along. I think these days, as we know, it is hard sometimes to speak out when we know things are wrong. And we know that if we do speak out, then we are really going to cop it from certain quarters of the world. And that is life, that is reality. But we don't stay silent about what we see is wrong. In verse 22, when he actually was invited to the Areopagus, he showed respect to the people that he was talking to. He didn't put them down. Paul stood up in the meeting and said, People of Athens, I see that you are in every way very religious. He was there as their guest. They had asked him there so they could hear more of what he was saying. So it started with a relationship and mutual respect. That needed to be earned by Paul. And for us, if we want to earn someone's respect that we want to, to share the gospel with, it will not always be easy. It will take commitment from us to build that relationship. It will take time and effort. Often words are not enough. Often actions speak louder than words. And it will take prayer. He showed respect. He didn't stand up and give it to him straight away, did he? Verse 23, he looked and listened to the people of Athens before he went and spoke to them. He got to learn about their culture. He walked around and observed and listened to what they said. Verse 23, he said, For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I have even found the altar with, no inscription, with this inscription. And in verse 28, he also added, As some of your own poets have said, We are his offspring. 
So in other words, he knew the culture that he was, in, he was with. He, even though he traveled from town to town to town, he got to know the people that he was sharing the meals with. He got to know the people that he was sharing in the marketplace. He looked at what they learnt. He looked at where they were coming from and what was their priorities. He listened to what they said. And because of that, they listened to him because they recognised that he had taken the time to get to know them. Paul found ways to speak in the language of his audience. And young people, especially millennials and others, especially need to know that if we can speak their language, they are interested in, to know if we can, if you can, I, no, I'll start that one again because I've got that one all wrong. Young people especially want to know if you can speak their language. They are interested to know if you can identify on their level and within their cultural framework. As a mortgage broker, a few years ago, I used to run a few brokerages. Before I visited someone to get to know them and hopefully get some business out of them, I would want to know as much as I could about them before I stepped through their door. Find out as much as I can. I would even send them information sheets to say, fill this all out and send that back to me and then before we meet so I can get an idea of who you are and what you're wanting to do. But then when I stepped through the door, when visiting them, I would look around the house as I walked through the hallway to wherever we sat. I would look at the front yard and those sorts of things like that so that I could engage in conversation about them. So I would try to compliment them on something. That's a great looking family based upon the picture I saw on the wall or on the fridge or the artwork or something like that. If there's a lot of sporting gear around or trophies, tell me about what these trophies are for. Things like that to engage the people so that they will feel comfortable with me as their broker and let me get a loan for half a million dollars for them. But the point was, I got to know them first. I didn't come with a set agenda, that's what you're going to get from me and that's it. I listened and looked. And Jesus was a master at sharing the kingdom of God through everyday examples in the parables and he used that everybody identified with. We need to be careful, but because people will see straight through us if we try to bluff or try to be fake about what we do and say. Get it wrong and you can lose all respect of those you are going to get to know and it will take a long, long time to get that back. I think these days too many of us talk a lot but we don't always feel the need to hear other people's pain or hardships that they're going through. And we really, really need to learn to listen to others. Learn to ask the second question. Everybody asks the first question, how are you? As you greet each other or having cups of tea and coffee. And most people respond with good, not really thinking that the person asking the question really wants to know how they are anyway, or may want to share about it. So we need to be willing not just ask the first question, but then go on to the next question. But, and to really listen as they answer. What is the second question? The answer is anything that will allow them to share their life with you. And that will change from person to person, from generation or whatever. So ask, be prepared to ask the second question. Verses 24, Paul shared life and hope for the people of Athens, not judgmental rhetoric and condemnation about their behaviour. Paul spoke with an internal sense of meaning, hope and inspiration. Paul gave people answers to their present problems. And the youth of today want to know the answers to the questions that they are facing today. They are not ready to wait for solutions or problems that they will face many years from now. They want to know now some of these questions. You've got to remember also that these people that Paul was speaking to weren't believers. So as much as Paul was distressed about the choices that they were making, he was more concerned about their souls. And that's important. I think sometimes we are guilty of focusing on the wrong things, especially with young people. 
and how they act and interact with others. I just want to close with a couple of stories just to emphasise this. I was talking with a good friend of mine who, was, who has worked with youth for nearly 30 years and what she shared made me think. She shared a story about a 14-year-old young guy who had been struggling with life but he was at the church service helping them with the overheads. Remember the old overheads where you used to change them for the music and do things like that? That's actually one thing that stood out when I first visited this church many years ago, that you guys were still using overheads. And I thought we'd moved on from there. <laughs> but he was helping them with the overheads. An older gentleman walked past him. And instead of affirming him for helping and being there and doing this, he severely chastised him for wearing a cap in church and knocking the hat off his head in process. How would that make him feel? What was more important? So for this friend of mine, the youth leaders in the church acknowledge, they learn to acknowledge that the youth often lead double lives. We get that. They are inflicted with so much stuff happening and information and peer pressure and things like that, that sometimes where they are at school like with friends is different to how they are at church. We get that. But the leaders there, and what I would like us to be also, is to, to affirm them that they are here at least. To not put them down about other things, but they are valued because they are here and they will be respected and they will be treated as champions while they are here. And as time goes on, as that respect then grows between both parties, then we can then speak into their lives and life choices afterwards. But it's not the first thing that we do. Remember, we are the church, you and I. I was at dinner at the Hogsbreath, the weekend that over a thousand women bikies broke the record. And at the dinner at Hogsbreath, there was this long table set up down the middle. It was filled with some of these ladies. And it was obvious from their dress and manner what their life choices were and which side they leaned. It made me think, but what if some of them decided to come to our church service the next morning? Would they be greeted and welcomed with respect and genuine affirmation that we want to get to know them? What sort of church would they see in us, in our behaviour, what we say and what we do? I went to, I used to, well, I grew up in a church in the middle of Brisbane, and it was a very conservative church. And when I was 17 or 18, I was into the motorbikes, a bit like, not as much as I am now. But being a mechanic and into racing cars and motorbikes, I had the mullet, the beard, the Harley type motorbike, was I well kept? Not always. And I hadn't been at this church for quite a few years because our family had moved. But this was a church that probably almost half were my relatives. And the other half were belonged to another family that they started intermarry and so you really couldn't tell one from the other a lot. And as I said, it had been quite a few years. And out of the spur of the moment, I decided to go to church this morning and the only park that I had available for my motorbike, which was very loud, was right in front of the steps of the church. So everybody heard me come, hopped off. I hadn't been home for a little bit, so I was fairly dirty and not the most presentable. My leathers off, walked up. And I did get a shake of the hand at the front door by my uncle, but he didn't recognise me because it had been a while. And I went and sat down in the, in the service. There's probably, you heard about the 30, you know, 30 centimetre rule between couples and stuff like that. I had a 10 foot rule between where I sat and everybody else around it. It was like this big semicircle that nobody just wanted to sit beside me. And yet they were my relatives, but they couldn't see past how I looked and how I arrived at church. That spoke a lot to me. That spoke a lot to me. If we are, as a church, you and I, going to be relevant to the people around us, 
then we need to be like Paul, become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul found common ground with those he ministered with, similar goals and interests. He avoided condescending attitudes, but humbled himself to to identify on the level with those he ministered to. He made others feel accepted for who they were. People don't care too much what we know until they know we care. He developed a loving and trusting relationship with the people he ministered to by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was sensitive to the needs and concerns of each person regardless of their background or weakness and looked for opportunities to tell others about Christ as the solution for life's problems. If the whole church, I'll leave that on there, if the whole church, all of us want to to develop this, imagine what could happen. Let your mind run wild with the things that could be like, what this worship service could be like the impact we could have on each other our family friends workmates and community and i pray that the holy spirit to fill everyone with the desire and passion to listen to learn to become all things to all men so that by all possible means we might save some Let's close in some time of worship, Bruno.